Doing that, it, it also reminds us of the way we're all connected as a, as a global community. And, the, and it brings to mind the oneness that we're all under the same creative force. One of the questions as a clinician I ask always my patients is um, who are you and what do you want? And you'd be surprised how few people know who they are and what do they want. And literally, if you know the answer to this question, many of our processes and many of our interactions and many of our reactions change just simply by that. And really, the process of consultation has been given to the world for that purpose, for us to know who we are and what do we want. They say a professor in, in England had it on his answering machine. Anybody would call him? That was the question. He says, who are you and what do you want? <laughs> Wonderful. Wonderful. Okay. And actually, one day I had emailed somebody something, and they emailed me back, who are you? And what do you want? <laughs> I thought, wow, I don't have any clue. <laughs> At the heart of why consultation is given to the world, which is through the whole concept, through the whole package of the Baha'i um, message, is the, the concept uh, of the evolutionary nature of the identity of man. A la Ericsson. <laughs> you know, Ericsson says, you know, we are one man, but we change. Our identity evolves. Although we are uh, the same man, but at two year old, we are not uh, the same as we are at 16. And we don't want to be treated the same way when we are 16 as our mothers treated us. At two, it's just not appealing. So therefore, although there is the same reality, but the identity evolves. And so the Baha'i concept believes that man as a whole, as a civilization, also moves through developmental stages of identity change. And therefore, what the belief is, is no longer in its um, toddlerhood, infancy, or adolescence. It is at the verge of maturity. And his actions and his decisions and his perceptions, and more than anything else, his self-concept, who he is and what he wants, is going to have grave implications, grave implications for the whole planet. No longer we can afford to think only about, not only our positions, which we talk about in an adversarial situation, Neither we can only satisfy ourselves with the whole issue of interests, which is in mediation. We are going to have to move beyond that into a new identity who we are. And that, within the Baha'i concept, is a cell within the body, a wave of the ocean, like the leaves of one tree, and that is how we are related to one another. So in my work, that when families, when couples come to the place to realize how important they are and their cooperation, they, they, it would make a difference in the way they look at each other. And they will, they will think twice before they hack at one another. So I'd like to share with you this. This comes from Unity and Consultation Foundation of Sustainable Development. This is quoted in the blue book that Judge Dorothy Nelson, our very eloquent um, federal judge who is always one of the promoters of alternative dispute resolution. And Dorothy very eloquently, she's given that talk in High Peace Chair at the University of Maryland. It says, as the 20th century draws to a close, and mankind is emerging from its rebellious adolescent stage of development and reaching out to attain maturity, humanity is now confronted with a series of interrelated problems that threaten both the fabric of civilized life 
and the natural world itself. The resolution of these problems, crushing poverty amidst vast sections of the developing world, oppression of women and minority groups, intractable political, religious, and ethnic conflicts, and disruption of global ecosystems, among others, would require unprecedented levels of cooperation and coordination that surpass anything in humanity's collective experience. So we are not going to be able to resolve it with what we knew. If we keep doing what we did, we're gonna keep getting what we got. And that's not gonna be enough, especially now that we are in each other's backyard, not only that, in each other's homes. Look at the internet, how it has removed every boundary that we thought. And it is clear that the boundaries that we thought, they are only nothing but the figments of our imagination. So therefore, we need to shift to a new reality. Again, who are we and what do we want is the question. And here it says, and that must go beyond the adversary system as we practice it, obviously. This is a process of education. It is not only for lawyers, it is not only for teachers, it is not for the, only for educators, it is not only for parents. This is for the grassroots. Because the problem that we are dealing with has to be dealt with by every single human being on the planet. Because every single cell in the body counts. We have a friend who just went for a surgery, a prostate surgery. There are only one cell that was going crazy in there. They tore the whole person apart for that just one cell. And they were quite justified. But they knew that was very dangerous. So every single human being is supposed to be educated and trained about this whole su subject. And the question is, who are we and what do we want? And some of the explanations that need and must to be there, it's about how are we interdependent. One of the passages is uh, talking about the whole concept. It doesn't matter from what religion, what background, this is a, the spiritual heritage that humanity has to work with. It's God's purpose in sending his prophets. Whether it's Moses and Jesus and Buddha and Krishna and Zoroaster and Muhammad, whatever, it just doesn't make any difference. Unto men is twofold. The first is to liberate the children of men from darkness of ignorance and guide them to the light of the true understanding. So remember, it's true understanding. The second is to ensure the peace and tranquility of mankind and provide all the means by which it can be established. So two things we need. How to understand one another and how to live in peace with each other. And gosh, if you don't have that, there's no family, there's no community, there's no civilization, there's no life. Consultation is a spiritual conference, is a spiritual process as it is a practical step that brings this to reality. We can do the walk. This is the walking the talk kind of a process. The most important principle of divine philosophy, talking about transformation, talking about our spiritual nature, what I believe is man is in reality not a physical being once in a while have, happening to have a spiritual experience, believe it or not. We are spiritual beings happening to have a physical, transient experience. And that's another one of those, who are we and what do we want? Because once we know that, maybe it will not make much of a sense to fight over a house or a car or how much settlement I'm going to have or Maybe it would become more important for me to know what is the spirit and the soul of my child is going to be like once I'm done with this settlement. The most important principle of divine philosophy is the oneness of the world of humanity. Change of identity, again. The unity of mankind, the bond conjoining east and west, the tie of love which blends all human hearts. It doesn't matter what background we come from. Therefore, it is our duty to put forth our greatest effort and summon all our energies in order that the bonds of unity and accord may be established 
among mankind. Notice there is no distinction as who. It's not the educated, it's not the rich, it's not the women, it's not the blacks, it's not the white, it is every cell. Then it says, for thousands of years we have had bloodshed and strife, it is enough, it is sufficient. Now is the time to associate together in love and harmony. For thousands of years we have tried the sword and warfare. Let mankind for a time at least live in peace. We don't even know really what it is to be in peace. What are these texts? They come from the Baha'i writings. This particular one is, is in the book called Prom Promulgation of Universal Peace. Actually, it is on the of Britain. And it is part of, some of them are part of the package, but if you're more interested, I'll be glad to do this. There is an interesting uh, story that comes from the mystical um, literature of Persia. And the founder of the Baha'i faith alludes to it in a different way. I and mean, some of you might be familiar with it. It's called, from Atar, the mystic poet, called the Conference of the Birds. How many of you know about the Conference of the Birds? It's very fascinating. This is Atar several hundred years ago, and talks about how a group of birds were told that there was an entity and a reality, very powerful, godlike, on top of a very uh, mysterious mountain, and if they can get there, they will come to witness this bird. And the name of the bird was Seymour, which literally means 30 birds. That's a, C means 30, and more means in Persian, bird. So. So they all start on this journey, and they suffer tremendously, and they really go through a lot of hardship. <clears throat> many, many moons pass, and they get there. And they're all sitting there, and all of a sudden, they keep looking and say, where is this mysterious bird? And nobody finds it. And as they're sitting around this circle, and they're talking to each other, and they're just you know, asking, all of a sudden, they come to realize there is 30 of them. The realization is, them who made it through the journey and got there are that reality. The oneness, the entity which is there, is one entity, and they are that reality. So that's the concept that I taught, which is called Conference of the Birth. In the Baha'i writings, the same concept is explained in the seven valleys, how we go through the stages of love, of knowledge, of bewilderment, and finally to the last stage, which is nothingness, nothingness. That means that man surrenders his will to the divine will. That oneness with everyone else. And that is the, the utmost. That is the shift of identity. That you become no longer the drop, but the ocean. No longer the leaf, but the whole tree. So that shift of identity is very, very clear, and that's part of the process of education. Consultation makes that reality possible. Because when in that spirit, because the spirit of getting together is very important, in that spirit when we get together and to share our thoughts and our feelings and our views, another reality emerges, which is no longer me, which is no longer Cynthia. It is something that we didn't even know existed. And ideas come into existence that we did not know could be there. And it makes it easy to emerge. And that is what we are looking for. It's like, you are a bird, but unless you make these two wings work together, you have never, can never know the experience of flight. And so that is what consultation is. Working with love and harmony together in order to make this flight Possible. Since you mentioned about prayer, it's a very important part of it because it's a spiritual conference. Because not only coming together of the two, of the people, but also coming together with their spiritual consciousness, with their reality of the Creator, or whatever it is that they think of. And in fact, it's very interesting because Gay Shi, how many people know here Gay Shi? She mentions about the four qualities of the most effective people that they are very hardworking that they have a good sense of humor. And consultation, by the way, has to be joyous. And one of the things people in consultation know, if it is not joyous, they know it does not have the spirit. It lacks the proper spirit, and it will not work. It has to be joyous. 
Here she says another one is support. Consultation is about a cooperative, supportive. You give your ideas no longer yours. Everybody else owns it. And then she says prayer. So qualities of the people who succeed. Prayer is one of them. So when we explain what consultation is, the new tool for universal enlightenment and global peace, the distinctive method of non-adversarial decision-making known as consultation is useful in virtually any arena where group decision-making and cooperation is required. I taught race unity to, and mediation to fifth and sixth graders at the public schools for five years. I wrote the program and element, uh, implemented the program. <coughs> I knew for sure, unless I teach them who they are, they won't be able to use mediation because if you don't, don't know who you are, you come from your adversarial sense of if, if I get all of it, then the other one is not going to get of it. If they get much of it, I will not get enough for me. That, that mindset, you can never solve the problem. It doesn't matter how many skills you have. It's an issue of attitude, who we are. So once we taught them the whole process, and one of the little girls in there, they get initially, she was just sitting like that, and I said, what are you doing? She says, oh, can my hand is stuck to my face. I said, oh my gosh, I hope she's okay. <laughs> <laughs> so at the end, she was beaming with power right after a year and a half, and the principal kept saying, gosh, I can't realize, I can't understand. This is, this is not this girl, she had no sense of self. And now she was ready to go and speak in front of the president about the issue of racism. You see, when a person knows who they are, you cannot even you know, contain them for what they can do. In, in essence, consultation seeks to build consensus in a manner that unites various constituencies instead of dividing them. It encourages diversity of opinions and has to control the struggle for power that is otherwise so common in traditional decision making. It is fascinating to know that it's prerequisite for any consultation to have unity. So you don't have consultation in order to have unity. You cannot have consultation unless you have unity. That means you can't fly unless your wings work together. So forget it. If you want to go find out what's going on up in the air, first you need to work the two wings together in order to get up there. So it's a prerequisite to have it. And I'd like to share with you a little uh, picture. Different um, elected bodies in the different parts of the world, they call Baha'i Spiritual Assembly. These are elected councils that work through consultation uh, in different parts of the world. The one which is up there, believe it or not, is National Governing Council of the Baha'is of South Africa during apartheid. Then look at their faces, first of all. I, I wish you could see it. And the joy in their face. This was illegal, and I bet you if they, would, they knew that blacks and the whites were sitting together in one room, that would be very, very dangerous. And then the, the one in the bottom, it's a village in Africa somewhere. People consult, and that's how they decide on their affairs. Doesn't matter how important, how significant, how insignificant. Families consult. Uh, communities consult, governments can consult. The whole administrative system of the Baha'i world, which is global and community, does its work through consultation. And as a result, the spirit of love and cooperation it is something to behold. And again, on the corner it says, He who is your Lord, the all-merciful, cherishes in his heart the desire of beholding the entire human race as one soul and one body. That is the desire, that is the spiritual destiny. That's who we are, and that's what we should want. There is a story that I've enjoyed very much to share, a new packed program for parents who go through divorce and custody at courts. And uh, you know, when the parents come there, they are really divided. And this poor child in the middle who is depending on these two wings to take them off, and these two wings are hacking at each other at any cost. And this hostage, this child in the middle, who can't do anything to get himself free, is begging as though to give these two wings, please, could you, could you work in harmony for my sake? The hope is that we can look at our identity and say to ourselves, is this serving me right? 
is this going to keep me going and we can continue this civilization? Or are we going to fall apart as we are already in Bosnia, in Ireland, in, in Persia, in... I don't, I don't think there's any corner which is healthy left any longer. There's no limb that is not aching and not bleeding. But you have it in your package. It's a star, a shape of a star. I use it in my clinical work. He just um, tells you how, how important and significant it is how we see ourselves. And based on that, we can change our processes. For example, if I see myself in conflict in an adversarial uh, state with someone else, my thoughts come from that energy. Uh, obviously, my feelings will come with that energy. And my intention, my wants, and my needs reflect the same at this inner system. A few days ago, a patient of mine came and said, they are throwing uh, out the aid in my little daughter's class, who is having completely difficulty in speech. They're throwing the aid out. Can, we, can you come with me as, a, as my therapist and tell them that they shouldn't be doing that and fight for me? And I said, oh, OK, well, let's look at that. I said to her, I said, you know what? I realize that you are very attached to this concept that maybe we should tell the teachers not to do that or that. But how about if we go with an open mind? How about if we go with the mind that these teachers love your daughter just as much? And they want her best. And let's go and see what we can discover rather than go with a predetermined idea. And she said, that's OK. We can do that. So we went there and we sat. And lo and behold, what we discovered. After all these teachers and aides and uh, speech therapists got together, something that we would have never known if we had used an adversarial or any other system. And the, that, that the kid was suffering from what they call the voluntary mutism. When the child uses control not to talk mm, in order to control the situation. And they didn't know themselves. I mean, the, the people there, some of them knew, some of them didn't. And this made the whole process completely different and the remedy completely different. Being attached to our thoughts, our adversarial thoughts, would deprive us of the understanding that we are entitled to and the transcendence that we are entitled to. And consultation, because it requires that we be in unity, and because it requires that we be in a spirit of love, and because it believes that nobody has the truth, but everyone coming together will bring out the truth, allows a new reality to emerge and be discovered. Being able to be detached from our thoughts is one of the greatest tests or beliefs that man faces. And the story reminds me of the hunters in Southeast Asia when they go hunt a monkey. And they know what the monkey likes. What the monkey likes. What is the monkey really likes? Yeah. Banana, of course. So the hunter goes and takes a gourd, cuts it real good, empties inside, makes a little hole, puts a banana in it, ties it to a tree, and walks away all the way over there and stands there. And the monkey comes and he's smelling. So, wow, it's a banana here somewhere. And he looks at the, that board, and he puts his hand inside of the board, and he's hanging on to the banana. And what do you think he's going to be trying to get his yeah. hand out? Oh, yeah. What do you think happens? He can't, get, he his can't get his hand up. And then all of a sudden, he sees the hunter coming for him. And he knows that it's going to be the time he's going to grab him by the neck, and it's going to be the end of him. But you know, it never ever occurs to the monkey to let go of that banana so he can go free. And he stays there hanging onto that banana until he dies. And you know, I really think a lot of the, the whole situation with humanity, we are hanging on to so many bananas that we are not even aware that we can let go of them. And among them is our adversarial attitude, the way we see things, and the fact that we don't ever even think it is possible to be in peace with one another. And that possibility, that paradigm shift, is just impossible. And so with our minds, with our minds and hanging on to that banana, we bring ourselves to the execution. And that is the situation we're dealing with today as we're sitting here. And look at every corner every corner. And we think that our children being in America are free. I mean, my son travels all over the world. I'm sure yours do too. Where are they going?
going to be, he would be safe just in case he has to go to a hospital for a blood transfusion. I can't just make America safe and then sit here and be. So this whole concept, that the fact that we live in an interdependent world makes it essential that we come up with a system such as consultation that goes beyond mediation, beyond dialogue, beyond interest into a new identity. So we can live the new identity, and that is our oneness. And Cynthia will go into more detail about nuts and bolts of consultation. And then afterwards, I'll do an exercise with you. Maybe you can tell me how we can fill in the gaps. Yeah. And I want to give you a little bit of idea of my own exposure to needing to learn a little bit more about consultation. As Kayvon said at the beginning, she and I served on a committee together, and it was um, in, in a small town. And we would talk about regular kind of issues that came up. But then I was put to the test because I was appointed to a Baha'i National Committee for the Equality of Women and Men. And use the consulta consultation in terms of getting prepared for that and working with, Kayvon was one of the people, but then we had two men from our community also sitting together to really talk about what can we do, what would be the best way to try to bring this subject to the forefront. And we have a booklet that is in the back there, but it's two wings of a bird. Kayvon referred to that analogy of male and female being the two wings of a bird, and the equality of women and men. And when we set to consult about this, the guys were saying that you know, maybe there's not really an issue anymore today. I mean, you know, look at women in all these roles and positions, and there, there might not be an issue. And there's a statement, paragraph in the statement, that talks about the damaging effects of gender prejudice or fault line beneath the foundation of our national life. Now, this sort of struck home to me because once, I, I moved to California about 15 years ago, and once we bought our home, someone explained to us about the Andreas fault line. It was, you know, relatively close. So this paragraph sort of struck a chord with me. And it's talking about that the gains for women rest uneasily on unchanged, often unexamined, inherited assumptions. And so now if you think that there's not a problem anymore, then, you know, I was thinking, well, gee, in a workshop, if I'm trying to get people to give me what some of those assumptions are, but if people don't think there's a problem, you know, nobody's going to have anything to say. So, therefore, if you really want people to reflect more, it's good to let them write. So, I had passed out sheets of paper, and I said, just on each sheet, write one assumption. And some people said, well, can I have an additional sheet? So, I saw people furiously writing all these assumptions about women and men. But then when I asked people after they have been writing for some time, I said, okay, hold it, hold it, hold it. All right, why don't we read some of these? And there's absolute silence. And I'm going like, wait a minute, I know I saw people writing. I know there were ideas or what's going on. So I said, oh, do you want to pass them up? And I read, oh, yeah. They wanted to get rid of them because nobody wanted to be held accountable or blamed for thinking what they were thinking. So when they passed them up and I started reading them, I was like, oh my gosh. I mean, like, women are weak, men are strong. Um, I mean, and, and, and I had a big stack there. So I knew I was going to need help getting through this. And I think if I hadn't consulted about this to start with, and I hadn't thought that this was a good idea, at that point in time when I had that stack, I, I, would, I know I would have just second guessed myself. Oh no, I shouldn't have tackled this. Oh, what am I doing? But part of the consultation process is to think about it, to, to look at your ideas ahead of time, to really look at the spiritual foundation of it, and then to go forward. Once you have a group consensus, then you really move forward with it. So in that moment when I had those, I had that sense of confidence that this is going to work, you know, that this process will work. And, and so I got through it. I elicited some help, though, to help read those things because they were really sort of painful. And what I, part of, part of the notion too is that how do you then look at these issues still with love and compassion and respect for everybody there? 
not to gloss over the real issues, but not to make it divisive. I think so much what I've seen, because I've worked in multi, multicultural issues and gender issues for quite some time, is that some of the meetings you go to, everybody just feels beat up at the end of it. Either beat up or misunderstood, I'm not ever going to go back and talk to those people again about that subject. You know, and consultation gives us a way of tackling the hard issues. And no one's getting beat up, but no one has to be silent. We all get to express what we're really feeling, what we're thinking, but we do it in a loving, respectful manner. And, and that's, that's the part that we want to talk about. How do we make that happen? And as Kayvon said, there's so much to the notion and, and the spiritual principle of the, the oneness and unity. That is foremost in our minds and in our hearts and in our spirits as, as we sit down to do consultation. Definitely you have these in your packet, but part of it I wanted on this middle one, that the well-being of mankind, its peace and security, are unattainable unless and until its unity is firmly established. Unity really is that key foundation that we're needing to look at. And when we think about, when we add the gender issues, or when we add racial and ethnic issues, when we add class differences, we really then need a hundred times more consideration and tact when issues like this are being um, addressed. And so we have to then stretch that much more even beyond ourselves. We have to become that much more detached or at least thinking of it from the global perspective. How are we going to make the whole situation better? I think since you're here, you probably are already realize that we need to take action for what we say we believe in. If, if we say that something's important to us, we need to be able to have some way of proving that, some way of demonstrating that. And I love this quote. Know ye not why we created ye all from the same dust, that no one should exalt himself over the other. Ponder at all times in your heart how you were created. Since we have created you all from the same substance, it is incumbent upon you to be even as one soul, to walk with the same feet, eat with the same mouth, and dwell in the same land. That from your inmost being, by your deeds and actions, the signs of oneness and the essence of detachment may be made manifest. And when I first read that, that, that part about detachment didn't make sense to me because it's like, well, no, you should be, you can't. I was thinking of detached as being aloof from it. But here it's more like the detachment from what you might say is self-identity and looking more at that, the global picture. And then the question of what profit is there in agreeing that universal friendship is good and talking of the solidarity of the human race as a grand ideal, unless these thoughts are translated into the world of action, they are useless. The wrong in the world continues to exist just because people talk of their ideals and don't put them into action. How do we put this into action? We really want to meet together to talk, and this could be an area of dispute or conflict between, between two people or between a whole group. Uh, it, works, it works really good in both situations. And some of the Baha'i writers talk about consultation as like that lamp of guidance. It's really going to bring the light to the subject and really provide uh, greater awareness. It really provides a means of being able to talk with each other, to communicate with each other, and to still know that it's all going to be towards the common good. When you do this, are you starting all the way from a place where people trust each other, or are you using it as a means to become distrust? Does that question make sense? It does. Do people already trust each other when they walk into the room? When you come together, 
You said distrust, but it might be that I just don't know you yet. So I, there may not be an element of trust, you know. But then the, the process helps build that. But can you explain the Buddha? It is it is the, the triangular relationship. It is not so much that I trust you per se, but it is the fact that I trust in God, and then you trust in God, and we connect in that. Sense. But you and I know that we both trust in God, and I believe that, that is, about you. That is essential. That is essential. And I already believe that about you, that you do. Exactly. That is essential, because otherwise, it will not. Yeah. In other words, you don't use this in divorce mediation. Yes. 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 yes, we do. <laughs> but, but do you do it? No. Do you use it in consultation between different uh, religious groups? <clears throat> Yeah. Yes. Do you use consultation with people who have already experienced betrayal from each other? You do? Yeah. Mm -hmm. But who would like okay. someone who, who would, you know, does not believe in being God or similar? If you yeah. have an agnostic or an atheist, you do that. Well, they might, they still probably believe in good, in a, a sense of good. I mean, Divine fact. You, you need to accept that you are the cell in the same body. I think it might be a good idea to explain the difference between unity and oneness and sameness. Because you said you have to have unity for this to work. And if we have the diversity of different thoughts and ideas and religions and interests, then where does that unity come in? How do we, what kind of unity or oneness are we talking about as opposed to sameness? Which is the unity of purpose and unity of vision and unity of goal, and that's, that's what brings them. And in divorce mediation, you know that it is the children, for example, that brings them together, in some sense. So they have a desire to resolve it on That is it. I think I understand the, uh, of the central foundation of what you're talking about here. I think I heard. What I'm having trouble with is transferring it into the process of, say, this week, I did a mediation between two neighbors, and they hadn't spoken to each other for three months. And uh, it, it, the issue over noise, then the issue over cat odor, then the issue of the fact that one of the people has MS and feels her life slipping away from her. And so all her anger is now directed at her upstairs neighbor who's playing his stereo so loud. And there is no sense of belief in anything. One feels betrayed, One, I mean, there's so much emotion surrounding these two people and I'm listening to what you're saying and what I'm picturing is a nirvana <laughs> basically and I'm wondering well how would I take the principles of consultation to two neighbors who haven't spoken for three months and have all this emotion surrounding their their relationship or is it even for that I mean, is it is it that's exactly my same yeah. question is it to overcome a place where people are already very divided and get, or do you, is it just, you just do it where that sort of anger doesn't exist to start with? That's oh, exactly yeah. my question. Yeah. No, I mean, there definitely is anger and, and hurt feelings and real, real issues of, and divided opinions. So they walk into the room, so that, that's what we right well, not always. Sometimes the court says you will walk into the room. <laughs> I mean, I think there has to be a will. I mean, the willingness there would be to bring about that sense of harmony again. I mean, so that they each can can live without. You know, always the goal. Yeah, I mean, and so you still draw on that and use that as as a key point of connecting. Is that the job of the? person convening the consultation to seek to try to draw out what that unifying principle might be. And maybe what's unifying is the fact that we're in the same building. And they have certain you know, uh, desires for peaceful living and to try to what something like that to get the focus towards so they can have some common uh, something. Yeah, yeah I mean, you, you do, you're going to have to have a common, a common goal, a common purpose there. And people have to be coming in willing to be open to finding a real solution, looking for 
a creative solution that, that neither of them on their own can find. Key elements though, that, that are necessary is a purity of motive. So looking for that link that will bring the both, both parties or both sides of various opinions together. Um, and a sense of uh, the spiritual aspect to it, of recognizing that, as we used to say growing up, you know, what goes around comes around. And so that you, you have to find a way to work in harmony uh, if, if that's the kind of environment you want ultimately for yourself. And so that, that sense of connection to, to that spiritual dimension, if you will. And so not in it just for a short-term solution, but, but really for a long-term well-being of yourself. I mean, it, it's really selfish, but it's, it's really global at the same time. I mean, you're not just being global just to be nice, but it's going to help you. And then also recognizing that when you're walking there, you don't really have a solution already. You're really coming in to find a, a new way of handling it. That your way, that person's way, neither is, is going to work exactly that way. And really, with that sense of humbleness that I don't know the answers, I don't have the answers, you know, together we get to something that we can, that, that will make it work for us. So, realizing that it there is a sense of patience required in this. You do need that sense of absolute love and harmony. Now, that's where you're saying, well, can it already be some hard feelings? Yes. And love in a global sense here. Uh, and as part of that recognizing that my little toe is part of the whole body. You know, so I can't just ignore it. And, and so that kind of, of love for all the members, all the parts of the body. Or, and recognizing that kind of connection. Even if you're coming in with a sense of hostility, maybe a sense of hurt, there still needs to be what we would call just basic manners that amazingly so many people <laughs> didn't get today. <laughs> but um, just the idea of courtesy and, and respect and dignity and, and moderation, being able to say what you feel, but not blast everybody with that. Not necessarily to hold back and feel like you can't give your opinion because it might hurt someone's feelings, but to do a respectful way. So, okay, okay I'm going to pass this to you. You see, there, there are three columns in there. I tried to distill as much as I could from the Baha'i writings, consultation versus mediation, and dialogue versus um, the concept of belief. What I like to give you is part which is the behind consultation. You tell me the other two parts, okay? So this is going to be a cooperative joint thing. Behind consultation is a spiritual concept. It means it has a spiritual dimension to it. Coming to realize that I am not a physical being, but I am rather a spiritual being walking on earth, that is very crucial is a distinctive method of non-adversarial decision-making using in the useful virtually in any arena where group decision-making and cooperation is required. What would you put on the mediation? What would you put on the debate side of that? Any suggestions? Well, for me, the way I do mediation, the way I approach mediation, is I don't look at it as business Okay. Because I do neighbor-neighbor, I've done relationship solutions, I've done uh, Landlord tenant. And okay. So it's definitely not a business meeting. Yeah. I think of it as having a spiritual component, but participants might not. But my approach is spiritual. And so my, and I'm definitely not an adversarial, otherwise, with the media. <laughs> so you see a great deal of similarity. Oh, absolutely. Okay. So let's go to the second one is inclusive. That means encourages diversity of opinions and act to control the struggle for power that is otherwise so common in traditional decision making. That means if you're a child, if you're an adult, if you're of different religions, if you have no money, if you have no education, it does not lessen you or make you more or less as the contribution to the consultation. Because of your position or lack of it, it's not the issue. That the fact that you are a human soul is the issue. So that's the spirit of consultation. How would you put it in mediation, and how would you write the debate aspect of it? 
quote that's saying the same for mediation and you've already defined the base at the end of the sentence. Okay. That was easy. Yeah. Okay. Actually, I would go one step further and say in mediation what you're trying to do is, is create a, uh, alternatives and options which really will allow the participants to have their own way but not at the expense of someone else. Talk about it as making the pie bigger so that everybody gets the size they want. It doesn't require agreement on anything except how big the pie would be. And in consultation, in, there is no mediator or facilitator. In consultation, the spirit of consultation, everybody participates, and the rules will govern the process of consultation. So if I speak, you are quiet and you listen. And if you speak, I listen, and so therefore the whole process, and if I raise my hand and say, I want to say something, and so this process mm, proceeds, and the understanding, all of a sudden, and I listen to you with a spirit, with a special attitude, and we'll, we'll proceed later on. When you can associating with another attorney who is also likes mediation, trains in mediation as a mediator, our discussions tend to be more like that than your typical lawyer discussion. There tend to be a lot more listening because an attorney, I don't think any, anyone who experienced a business person, psychotherapist, whatever, that has a lot of experience with dealing with people, has all the both understanding and skepticism about his or her client, the subject matter, and it gets more willing. So in essence, what you're talking about is the spirit. Is if the spirit is amicable and friendly and cooperative, somehow the act follows. And the behavior follows the spirit. Okay. <laughs> I mean, if you're, you and your friend, you and your attorney friend are in good terms, in other words, the nature of your conversation is going to be different than when you are conversing with another one who are in conflictual spirit. Yeah, but I think also our understanding of the kinds of problems and of human nature. Right. I mean, I think there are lots of people that are friends and negotiate that hide everything from each other mm -hmm. nonetheless when they're dealing with business. And that's different. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, let's go a little bit deeper and then we'll then okay. we can open it up for all kinds of comments. Unity is prerequisite. It requires two essential conditions in consultation. The first duty of the members is to affect their own unity and harmony in order to obtain good results to find the truth. And that means that when you come and sit in consultation, you're saying to me that I'm going to join with you in looking at this problem here and try to understand it. And in my clinical work, I say, well, you know, you're the mother, you're the father, you're the same. But the problem is not in you, but the problem is somewhere in the middle. Can we, all of us, use our faculties and try to figure it out and look at it and discover it? And somehow, in a way, mentally separating yourself and taking a distance and looking at it over there really helps people to come to see it personally. So how would you put that in dialogue and how would you the part which is for debate. I mean, the debate, I tried to pick it up from very famous people for the debate part, so we don't have any uh, work to do. But how would you put the mm, dialogue or the mediation? Are they the same? Can you see it different? What is your perception? I think that if you're already there as a prerequisite that people are in this state of mind before they, uh, what's, what's confusing me is that in mediation, people don't start out this way, but hopefully they end up this way through the process of mediation. And it is my perception about people that if they are already in this state of mind, conflict tends to sort of resolve itself or fall out. So I'm confused as about what's there to talk about when you walk into the consultation room if you're already in a spirit of goodwill, and, and if it's not about taking you from a spirit of bad will into a spirit of goodwill, what is it that you are doing? The consultation is not only for resolving disputes. So therefore, you're not coming to consultation only when you're having a conflict with someone. You can be in complete harmony with someone, but you might be really puzzled about something that you cannot make a decision. You don't know, for example, should we send the child to a school, the 
which is like about you know, five states away, or should we keep the child here and have him in a school? And the mother says, no, I think I should have him here because he, we need to be, for him to be close. And the father said, no, he needs to become a man. He has to go over there. So although you're attached to these ideas, and there is some kind of a disagreement, but you, back of your mind you say, there must be another truth somewhere, a way somehow, that maybe it's neither mine, neither yours. Let's go to consultation, and let's see if we can discover and see what could be. And they might come, and they might ask several of the people to sit down with them and throw out ideas, and look at the facts. And then they might see all of a sudden, there is a solution that maybe neither of them even could think of. I do. I, I think that you're going to see this now. I, I just, the reason that mediation attracts converts is sure. because it provides a roadmap to get to the place where you are in goodwill with another human being from being in a place where you are out of goodwill. So I would say that this is the end, not the prerequisite yeah. in mediation. Of course, we pray. We mentioned about the whole concept of prayer. Then we have a paradigm shift required. This one is proper spirit. The spirit of those who consult together is the main factor that makes the high consultation unique. The spirit must be gradually cultivated. It is the magnet of divine confirmation. In other words, in consultation, there is a great belief that there is another source of energy that unless we have access to it, we are operating on a very limited level. We become magnetic for that energy the moment we are holding hands. If we are not, the magnetism is not there. We lose our magnetism and we are operating on a very substantial level. So that spirit is very important. But also the understanding is not all of us all of a sudden have it. So it has to be cultivated. So therefore it is taught to children versus we teach them debate in schools. Consultation is taught in schools. Consultation taught through the process of growing up. In the family's consultation, is taught to the family members that is the way you solve problems. So as a result, you learn this feeling of being in consultation, that you, when you get into the chamber, you realize that there is a different mode that you need to elicit from your own. So it's almost like a conditioning. So therefore, it's a, it's a gradual, evolving, educational process. That you need to be patient with one another, so you don't say, Okay, so since you're so angry at me, and you're coming with such anger, I don't think we should consult, consult and so we're going to leave. No, we we do it, and each time we get a little bit better. What would you call the proper spirit of mediation? It is a trying of teaching mediation in schools, for instance, right. to try and teach children how to communicate better, um, non-violently. Right. And the program here, Pepper, I started is to speed resolution. Program. And, and still, uh, Larry Sullivan does a lot of work with churches where he is depending on there being a divine truth that everyone is accepting as not just authority, but uh, something that creates a loving spirit that raises the level of the dialogue. Right. And I think it's certainly in a lot of religious systems, it can work. And you know, Baha'i. So, I know I think as a mediator, that's what you, you try to create that spirit. If you're in a religious system, you've got one ready made, hopefully, right. to push. If you're, uh, say, disputants come out of the same tradition, so you can push for it. Otherwise, you're trying to reach for that magic. I mean, that's why mediators look you tell, you tell stories that if you're trying to seat certain commonalities that people can believe in or feel subject to. Uh, so they do let go a little bit. They, uh, they earlier separate the person from the problem and let go of your... your so you system. use some mechanism to lift them up, yes. Maybe on a, on a, a purely secular level, because this is in the mediation realm, where we are normally dealing in a much more secular level. Mm -hmm. uh, probably the equivalent of proper spirit is, a, is an acceptance on the part of the participants that there is a better alternative than litigation, which is the normal context in which we find these things, or self-help, going out and beating the hell out of each other. Mm -hmm. And so the proper spirit that, that we 
we need the people to come in with is simply a willingness to believe that there is something better than litigation or self-help. Yeah. The other thing we say, we are asked to suspend distrust either of the other parties or even better, uh, to trust the process, trust the media. We, we sort of elevate the process of the mediator to that almost divine status. Right. It's it's even so then you see the similarities and you see, so yeah. hopefully graduates, if you're going down, you can get the shape of this thing. <laughs> Collective genius asks for moment, momentary suspense of judgment in order to gain insight into things. And this enables one to delve into realities which are unknown and unexpected. So, yeah. there's, a, there's a technique called creative brainstorming, the rules of which are that you do not edit yourself or anybody else, that you shout out the first thing that happens, you edit it later, you get everything out on the on the board yes. or wherever, and yes. then you talk about what's wrong with it after. It's total suspension of judgment. Absolutely, it's, it's and exactly. you're absolutely right. And then and brainstorming is part of the process of consultation. Now, consultation is only 150 years old. So now, but it's very interesting to know the whole concept of self. The concept of self is a 20th century concept. We did not think about self, but this whole concept of self within the Baha'i writings has been there for in this last past 120, 50 years. Self has been, we look at it this way, and then there, we recognize there are two selves. We have a spiritual self, and we have a material animal self. And these two are in the same person. And so therefore, there, there is also always the possibility of conflict within. So there is always this possibility of consultation within. <laughs> so, yes, yeah. we consult with ourselves and with our soul. We say, you know, should I do it? Should I? I mean, even, even your work, you are different parts of our body for different cells, you know. This is the right cell, this is the left cell. And so that concept is there. How would you work with, um, as far as the genius, collective genius, you think that it's the same? It's, 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 it's there. Yes. Oh, so, brainstorming. Humility. In consultation, consultation wars against voicing our opinion as correct and right, mm -hmm. but setting it forth as a contribution to the consensus of opinions for the light of reality becomes apparent when two opinions coincide. Now, the concept of people in consultation, they know that it has to be just the opinions. It cannot be the personalities. If the personalities start clashing, it's going to be dead. I mean, but if ideas clash, the spark of truth will come from. Now, the discipline is to be able to separate your ideas from your own self. It is very hard. Because we have been taught that our ideas is ours. And we assert ourselves by opposing somebody else's idea. That is a training that we are taught in the Baha'i view absolutely is negating that. It says, whoever argues with another person to make themselves look good, both of them are wrong. So forget it, don't even worry about it. So therefore, this discipline has to gradually be nurtured. That I will offer my idea, no longer is mine. Once I say, maybe we should put all these chairs over there, then you might say, well, I think maybe we should, then I'm not gonna be attached to that idea. Whatever she does with it, I don't care because it is just that I can't let it go. I just have to let it go. If I go with it, then it's no longer spirit of consultation. It is going to be um, my little personality hanging around and getting bruised. And eventually, I will be on to be consultation. How does the concept, though, of persuasion fit in? There is no persuasion in the, in the process of consultation. Because you are open. There's no need for you to persuade me. I am open. Your idea, I'm, as you letting your ideas float, I am like a magnet trying to see how it works in this whole part, how I can build consensus with it. So therefore, I am attracted to your ideas. You don't, you don't have to go anywhere to con convince me. But it doesn't question. necessarily fit the mediation. Oh. Are you always together in the same room? What if there's an impasse? Do you ever caucus and go separate with an individual? Or? Actually, there's somewhere down in the bottom says, if this agreement happens, you cannot work in an environment where there is a sickness. What you do, you take a break, you say a prayer, you take a break, you go for a walk, you postpone. But you come back again together. Same day. There is no, or you can decide to come back later. But whenever it is, you come back when you are fit. You do not continue if there is wrangling and if there is differences and there is 
the feeding of negative feedings, you stop. But you ever work with individual individuals separate? It's there's no caucusing because there's no mediators. Okay. Everybody talks together. Yeah, there's no facility. No. There's no, no, but you can have a chairperson, you can have a secretary, and these are people who are officers, but they don't have any more rights or any special roles than anybody else, so they're part of the process of consultation. And if anything, the chairperson probably would wait to be last as far as expressing his views. Margaret, do you want to say something? I, I was just thinking that each of us has a, a, our own color of a little piece of wax. Yes. In consultation, this is your idea, and you've massaged it yourself, and your imprint is on it. But then you put it onto the table. It belongs to the group. Theirs mix in with it. You work together to massage it and to find the truth that exists in that conglomerate. And no one color is better than another. And no shape is better than another. But all are needed to reach the, the best consensus. Um, but there is no minority report or position of the opposition in the constitution process. Um, if a decision is wrong, let's say people make a decision, it will become evident in its implementation, but only if the decision-making group and indeed the community at large support it wholeheartedly. This commitment to unity ensures that if a decision or a project fails, the problem lies in the idea itself and not in the lack of support from the community that they sabotaged it. So basically, you make a decision, you support it, everybody supports it. And then you try it. If it didn't work, you all come back together, sit at the table, and then figure out another decision. Once you make that decision, you all support it. So you see, there's no decision. When, they come when, they, when the decision doesn't work. When, when the spirit moves you. <laughs> no, I, because, because everybody is supporting to make the decision work. And if you know that you were supposed to get something done and it didn't work, then there is a built-in process because consultation is part of the process of the life of the community. So you get together and you come back and you say, okay, what happened? How do we evaluate it? What is, everybody shares their views and they, uh, then um, they talk about it and might be that they decide this was not the right decision. Let's come up with another solution. So they will come up with another solution. I was just going to say, and this, the question of humility and the definition here says that uh, mediation and understanding of compromise. That's not true for me in mediation. It's not about compromise, and it's never about compromise for me. Uh, but for me, the idea about humility came, and it was a major movement for me when I realized I didn't have to come up with the solution. Mm -hmm. It was not my role as the mediator to come up with the solution for the parties. They have to come up with the solution for themselves. I can throw ideas on the table. I can help an environment where they can talk, but and neither of them has to compromise, and they're told that they do not have to compromise. And in consultation, it is no individual's responsibility to come up with a solution, right. but it is the group's responsibility to come up with a solution. Well, in this the case, ideal, it's right? It's the right. ideal is consensus. Mm -hmm. The ideal is if they cannot reach consensus, then they vote. But once they vote, even if it is five people against four, once they vote then everybody has to support that idea wholeheartedly, as though it was theirs. And then they will know whether the idea was good or not. Other than that, they will not, never know because somebody has sabotaged it. Come on, going back to your first idea of the requirement of unity, we're taught that unity is more important than the right decision. If we're unified in coming up with a decision and trying to implement it, that is more important than having found the exact right decision, because if we're unified, we'll come back together and the right decision will, will be discovered through the, the process of unity. The decision on the quote-unquote right idea is very, very, very diffused in the background. Yeah. The more emphasis is when we are working together. So people are not upset that they don't have the right decision. Okay. So this serves as a guide as you look at those. And Thank also, you. we wanted to pass out uh, this gift card to you that helps remind you of, of who you are and okay. what you are. Uh, so just take one of the cards. Long dream and think that we can ask them that. Are they all the same? Yeah, it's all the same. It's just a different design. But it talks about that the achievement of full equality requires a new understanding of who we are 
what is our purpose of life in life and how we relate to one another. If you need to, and understanding that will compel us to reshape our lives and thereby our society. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.